my name is David Chavis again, and as uh, D uh, Councilman Navarro said, I work for an organization called Community Science. Um, why I'm here today is also because uh, 30 years ago I worked, uh, as a, started my uh, career as a community organizer in Buffalo, New York, in a Puerto Rican neighborhood, uh, much like the movie West Side Story where we dealt with gangs and crime and economic development. I found through that the importance of, of what people will do for community, the good and the bad, I also learned about the importance of what peop the marvelous things people can do um, when they work together. And thirdly, I learned the importance of what happens when people, um, w the importance of information and the power that comes from that. Um, and so today, I think, uh, so my background has been around organizing, I've worked with communities around the country. Um, I think uh, Councilman Navarro said a lot about our organization. Um, maybe we'll go to the first. Greg, do you want to, maybe you can, you want to say something into yeah, yourself? Say, yeah, my name is just, Greg. Uh, again, my name is Greg Baker. That was a pretty ample uh, introduction, so I won't go over my background. But I'm, just for clarification, I'm not necessarily a community organizer by background, but I do have extensive experience in that through uh, the field of city planning, um, which is really my training. Um, and as many people get trained in city planning, they realize that you can't create city plans without the assistance and the... Um, input from communities so that's hence my uh, experience in this area and I think we got a couple slides where we'll talk about some of our organi organization and what they do uh, briefly again because it sounds like we had a pretty pretty uh, thorough introduction already y también hablo un poco de español pero tal vez es mejor que que hablo en inglés porque será más eficiente de esa manera no so today we're going to talk about something that's very American, very much part of the American tradition. Um, a lot of, there's two types of, we also talk about American democracy as being um, just voting, that you get to vote. But that's really a small part of what makes America great. What we've all learned is that the day-to-day -day democracy that happens every day across the country, that changes our institutions, that begins to make the change that really respond to what people um, need and want for their families and for their future. You know, we all have to recognize that all of us came here, no matter if we, we're talking to the Latino community today, but everybody came here as immigrants at one time. And we all started the same way, and we all came together, and our communities came together, working together from the grassroots up to lead to our success. So to be part of that process, we're all part of that process, no matter where we started from. And that it came again, and I'll keep on saying this over again, by people working together to be able to change our society and to make it better. Okay. Some of our greatest changes from, from Social Security to the Civil Rights Movement to the Women's Movement to the Disabilities Rights um, to things that we take for granted every day is very basic came from people like yourselves coming together, working hard, getting smarter, building relationships and making a difference. I'm going to talk a little bit if we get to um, opportunities, good. So we'll jump over. To, I just wanted to mention a little bit about where are we here. What are we going to talk about? Okay, let's do that. Um, <laughs> I will move ahead. So today we're going to talk about opportunities to um, for to how to improve your community. Okay. So let me ask you a question first. Okay. How do? Okay. Question. Pregunta. How do, how do people change their communities? What do people do? That's a question for you all. Organization, the organizations, yeah. right? They speak up, work right? Together. They work together. What else? Mm, learn. learn, good. Learn. Communing, organize, great. And you need to build relations and know each other. Okay, we're done. Okay. <laughs> One other thing, you have to celebrate your successes, and I think we've done it, right? <laughs> Do that. Okay, great, wonderful. We're going to talk about that today. So the topics, and I think next slide, is the topics today is that we're going to talk about um, community organizing in two different ways. One, for neighborhood improvement. And then for the second reason, um, we're going to talk about it also, next way, is addressing larger issues. How to begin to think about all those come working together, we find that we're all in it together, that our neighborhood, our community, our families are having the same problems. And how do we go move it a little bit higher to where we can make a difference in policies and other changes? We're going to talk about the key elements of organizing, no matter what you do and what you go after. The same kind of elements, pieces are there. And we're going to talk about that community organizing process. We're going to use two examples. 
One from a neighborhood organizing example, a neighborhood improvement effort that was done by Montgomery Housing Partnership. And the second one is going to be a video so that we can have a take a use of this wonderful facility um, about how parents like yourselves came together in New York City to change school policies there and to understand the potential of what you're about to start on working on what you're pledging to do. Um, so with that, we'll take, I guess, the next thing. Uh, neighborhood improvement. Okay, I'm, you keep in good pace. Will is moving me along here quickly. So now I'm going to turn it over to Greg. Okay, thank you, David. I'm just going to say a few words about uh, neighborhood improvement, which, again, in the context of what I do for Montgomery Housing Partnership, we basically have three primary functions. We build affordable housing within the county, which is a, a much needed uh, service. And we also go beyond the buildings and try to focus on the cohesiveness and strength of the neighborhood itself because we realize quality affordable housing is not really quality if the neighborhood itself is not uh, strengthened as well. And so there's different forms of organizing, but the way we've sort of uh, organized this particular presentation is that we're looking at organizing more from like a neighborhood level within the county, for instance, and then more of a structural policy level uh, on a county level. And a lot of this material is really rich, it's really deep, but we're just skimming the surface here. Um, one thing that I would recommend, and I think they may talk about during the next steps, is additional uh, opportunities for training, um, for reading up on some of these topics yourself, um, and for getting first-hand experience. So with respect to neighborhood improvement, um, why do we do that? Well, basically, or what is it? It's people from the same neighborhood who come together to develop their ownership and relationships um, in order to prove the conditions where they reside, sometimes called community building or community development. And so, again, those in and of themselves are sort of, you know, rich topics to discuss and could have entire workshops just on that topic. But basically, it amounts to people who are inter interested or passionate enough to see change in their community and their neighborhoods, whether it relates to the fact that people aren't speaking to each other or there's tensions, or there's street problems, or there's not enough trees in the neighborhood, or whatever the issue might be. That's something that the community themselves identify. So I think there's a slide in here. It's hard for me to see the slide yeah, in here, but yeah, yeah, about what changes. Again, this kind of speaks to what's, what are the sort of things that you can accomplish by coming together. Um, I've seen neighborhoods where crime has decreased significantly just because residents have begun to organize and talk to each other and form neighborhood watches, for instance. There's a neighborhood right down the road here called Glenmont. I don't know how familiar you all are with that community. But I think between 2008 and the middle of, actually, it's between 2009 and 2010, if you look at the police statistics for that community in this county, the crime dropped significantly. I think, I don't have the, the number at my fingertips right now, but it was at least 40 if not 50%. Um, part of the reason for that is that community started with one particular individual who was concerned. He had moved back to his community after 30 years from being away and he realized, this is not the same community I grew up in. I wanna make some changes. So he began to meet with some neighbors. They began to take on issues related to foreclosures, which we help them with since we're a housing agency. And they also looked at other issues. One of their main concerns, like I said, was crime. So this slide kind of gives you an overview of some of the things you can sort of begin to tackle or address just by simply organizing. Uh, the streets, building community again, sometimes neighbors don't even know each other. They don't even talk. Well, the starting point is getting people to come out and meet each other. And so I'm briefly gonna go over one, uh, just one little project that we did um, in Glenmont that related to healthcare. So if you wanna go to the slide says local example, or excuse me. Uh, says why do why do it yeah there you go okay so the question is why do this well in the case of Glenmont um, this is actually a very uh, pertinent topic since I understand a lot of you all work for the uh, or work with the school districts here in the PTA function or some other sort of function but at that time the PTA came to us saying you know we're concerned that the Hispanic community in particular that attend some of the schools don't have significant knowledge or access about local health services so in part of our effort, overall effort, to help to sort of bring Glenmont together, we went ahead and decided, well, what better way to address this issue than to bring the services and the people who pro provide the services to the neighborhood themselves. So we created basically a health fair. And uh, you can go on to the next slide about getting started. 
again, you can have an entire workshop on how to do these things, but it basically uh, boils down to starting with a few interested and passionate individuals, transmitting that interest to another set of individuals, and forming basically what we would call a planning team, which takes on um, you know, the event. You want to form a budget, you want to explore the sites where this could possibly happen, and then you want to choose a site. And then, of course, you want, obviously want to have activities that draw in people, fun activities. And you want to recruit, obviously, in this case, we recruited many exhibitors. We had over 25 exhibitors um, that attended. So next slide, please. OK, so the most cru crucial part, though, in any sort of organizing, is obviously, you want to reach out to the rest of the community. So one of the things we did was we worked through the local media, the local Hispanic radio stations, the local Hispanic newspapers, the churches. We also conducted door-to-door -door outreach. That's very important. And we sent uh, confirmations. There was constant dialogue between the planning team and the actual exhibitors, many of whom were school officials and county officials. So if you want to go to the next slide, that's an example of one of the flyers, which is completely in Spanish. There's one in English as well that we distributed to uh, get people to come to this particular event, which was in 2009. I'm going to go to the next slide. OK, so this slide is just basically the day of the event itself. We were a little worried because the, the, the weather wasn't that good that, that day. But we had a great turnout at Loiterman Middle School, representatives from the PTA, many members uh, from the health sector, both private, nonprofit, uh, and public within the county uh, showed up. They actually gave not only information, but actually it was a way to, for people to receive uh, real-time uh, services uh, and screenings, health screenings. Um, so there was information on diabetes, on you know any number of ailments or illnesses and and things that you know people could readily access right in their neighborhood next slide and then of course you know as i said you got to have fun and <laughs> as david mentioned you know we had a dj we had you know the the kids were were dancing we had a moon bounce we had the, the volunteer fire department that came out with a fire truck um, this whole event total was probably right around a thousand dollars but it could have been done for less frankly had we had more more planning time but you know one of the ways that you you do this aside from obviously involving your neighbors and the residents and most of the public institutions are more than eager to help with this sort of thing because they like to see people sort of taking ownership over these issues in their neighborhoods is to get you know some donations which you know again had we had more time and with other events um, we were able to get uh, quite a few uh, uh, donations that help with these sorts of sorts of things um, so next slide please and so again, this is one project of many projects in that neighborhood that we worked on. But this one project, you know, if you look at it, what was the impact of this? Well, before you didn't really have people that were talking to each other. Um, they weren't organized. They didn't come together around a particular event. In this case, we had over 100 residents that received health education and services, many of which actually had um, opted to get health screenings on the spot. And it also served as a platform again, uh, just form sort of like a core group of people that also went on to take on other issues in the neighborhood, crime, foreclosures, other things that they're continuing to work on today. And there's actually a Glenmont Civic Association that has grown immensely and is, and is thriving today um, a, as a part in result of some of these sort of community building efforts um, and community development efforts. So I'll turn it back over to David right now, uh, where David will speak a little bit more about uh, larger scale organizing and structural change and policy change, that sort of sort of stuff. So okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> that was quick. The um, so we're gonna talk about the um, larger scale change and what does that mean? Because a lot of neighborhoods, if you neighborhoods begin to work together, people in different schools, different in communities work together and they begin to see a common pattern. Sometimes the principal or the uh, police officer will agree with you in the policies or the, the, uh, uh, the regulations of that organization will allow them to be supportive. Sometimes the policies and regulations are not supportive of what you want for your families and for your children. And you begin to see that problem not only in your neighborhood or in your block, but across, let's say, your county or your city. Um, and so therefore sometimes it's important to look at the source of the problem and many times the people look at the source of the problem as the people in the community and not realize that the problem are the policies and the way that, that maybe schools or government or businesses operate that really may not necessarily be serving the best interests of the people in the community. So people come together to begin to change those rules and regulations to be able to do that. 
so that you begin, so the kind of changes that you see, so with, uh, I just, if you can go back again to the last slide, I'm sorry. The important thing is that, that addressing larger issues takes people working together to gain the power and the relationships to make the changes they want to see in their community and promote equity, promote equality. Um, the kinds of changes um, that we're talking about, as I said, changes in policies, increasing resources, having them be at least equally applied to people, um, developing relationships with government businesses and larger institutions like universities and colleges that you may not have, have had before, either individually or for other people in your community. Um, and then developing relationships with other groups, not only big institutions, but many of the problems of the Latino community, also problems of the African American community that are also problems of the Asian community, which is also the problems of many of the white community as well, longtime residents. And through <coughs> this process, we begin to learn that we're all in it together. Um, so what I'd like to do now is that I get to, uh, first of all, thank the translators, because I know that uh, that's the hardest job of all today, but I'm going to make it a little bit more difficult by having this video that we've gotten, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, so that it does have sections in, in Spanish, but also it's mostly in English, so I apologize <coughs> if there are difficulties in translation in advance. Um, take it away. The three collaborators came together to form that new citywide organization, the New York City Coalition for Educational Justice or CEJ, whose mission was to end the inequities of resources and... Oh. We went to the beginning? Oh. No, how happened? We're showing one section. So I'm excited to be here this morning. Stick. Go back to the room, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'll say that this is, this also, while he's getting it back, that this, this effort started by a number, just like I said, a number the of groups across the city came together to form that new to form a new organization, the New York City Coalition for Educational Justice, or CEJ, whose mission was to end the inequities of resources and outcomes across the city schools. These goals were ambitious but necessary. The school system, with a million students in 1,400 schools, was failing far too many of them. And parent and community participation in educational decision making had been eliminated by the new mayoral control legislation. The organizations that came together to create CEJ had real alignment in terms of who should be the drivers of change in communities. Ordinary people that know the real problems and ordinary people that actually have uh, ideas about what the solutions should look like. When we came together to create CEJ, one of the first things that took place was actually a retreat that brought together leaders from each organization to meet each other and to actually explore what are the issues that bring us together. In that initial retreat, the need to dramatically improve the city's middle schools as the critical platform for high school and college success emerged as the focus of CEJ's first campaign. Children did really well in third grade, less well in fourth, and by the time they got to eighth grade or middle grades, it was a mudslide and that the average child, no matter how smart he or she was, entered high school one or more grades behind. When we looked at the statistic, only one out of three kids was reading at grade level. Seeing those numbers and understanding those statistics was a real wake-up moment. The speakers, Christine Quinn, speaker of the city council, we were able, successful in setting up a meeting with her. She said, middle school is my baby, and I, you know, I've been trying to figure out a way to make it work. Once you meet with the CEJ leadership, it's very clear that they are parents, but they're also backed up by research. So it's kind of a great amalgam of the different pieces of what you need to get things done. She stood us at a press conference another cold winter day and said, we need to do some of our middle school. At the rally, CEJ issued a report demonstrating the systemic failure of middle school education, particularly for African-American and Latino students, and recommended comprehensive changes. The rally also announced the formation of the city council's middle school task force with two CEJ leaders Carol Boyd and Zakia Ansari among its members. CEJ really was kind of the 
uh, real life compass of the task force, if you will, because they could tell us whether the solutions we talked about were going to work in their neighborhoods, in their children's school. We never lost sight of who we were, why we were there, and what was in our initial platform because of how we operate at CEJ. There was constant reporting back to the body at large saying, this is where we are, where do we go now? At the press conference, after the middle school task force released its report, the mayor, the city council speaker, and the chancellor announced their response. A middle grades initiative that allocated $5 million to implement the task force recommendations in 51 poorly performing middle schools. CEJ pushed hard to make the middle grades initiative work, but the initiative seemed too limited in scope and too slow to take hold in the target middle schools. So CEJ intensified its campaign by organizing a major rally at St. Paul's Church in Lower Manhattan. So I'm excited to be here this morning standing with you on Martin Luther King Jr.'s holiday. We are rallying for the right of our children to get what they are due by law, a quality education. We may all be immigrants. However, we all have a common dream. The best life for our children, including the best education. Unfortunately for many of us, the middle grade schools our children are attending are failing them. Porque las escuelas intermedias están fallando a nuestros hijos. Por eso sí yo he trabajado fuertemente para mejorar las escuelas intermedias. Para mí es un, un trabajo extraordinario que estamos haciendo todos. Porque padres como yo en, en otras partes de la ciudad es, que este, hablamos diferente idioma, diferente cultura, pero queremos lo mismo. Sí, educación para nuestros hijos. Tenemos hoy aquí las caras de las personas que son afectadas. Los afroamericanos y los latinos son las escuelas donde tenemos más problemas, donde tenemos más dificultades, donde tenemos más disparidad. At the rally, CJ released a report analyzing the city's failure to reduce the achievement gap in the middle grades. The report recommended extending learning time implementing strategies to improve teacher and principal effectiveness, and providing the academic, social, and emotional supports necessary for student success. The report was produced for CJ by the Annenberg Institute for School Reform. The staff at Annenberg really understood their role as being primarily oriented to support the leadership of the parents that were coming together. And it did that by providing really good research. Every member of CEJ that I have met is extremely knowledgeable about middle school reform, about New York City data. So I would imagine a lot of the work behind the scenes is educational. Por ejemplo, si queremos un un estudio, un estudio de de cuáles son los exámenes que están pasando. Si hay una persona específica que se dedica a a buscar esos estudios donde nos dan un informe, ¿sí? Para, para, para cuando tenemos la campaña de mandar al Departamento de Educación, tú estás diciendo esto, pero eso está pasando. Annenberg staff not only generate the data that support CEJ's campaigns, the staff also provide data to the local campaigns of CEJ member groups. These teachers in Highbridge, a South Bronx community, are taking a walking tour organized by the Highbridge Community Life Center, a CEJ member group and its parent organizing arm, the United Parents of Highbridge. The teachers are familiarizing themselves with the Highbridge neighborhood and its history. There was a time in the early 70s where we had a strong neighborhood movement, strong parents and neighborhood movement, and we demanded Mayor Lindsay that he build us a new school. In surprise to us, they decided to build PS 126. It was a great victory of parent and community organizing. And that's why we think we can get that movement going again and get our middle school. I have raised seven children in Highbridge. All seven had to be put on city buses to go to middle school. Ridiculous. It is time for a middle school in Highbridge. As CEJ developed its citywide middle school campaign, the United Parents of Highbridge launched a local campaign for a new middle school in the neighborhood. 
Annenberg staff produced the research showing the need for a new middle school. You're not gonna get what you want unless you fight for it. You're not gonna get it because you need it. You're gonna get that middle school the day that we come together and we stay together and we keep the pressure on. For three long years, the United Parents of Highbridge kept the pressure on through local demonstrations, candlelight rallies, building support from elected leaders, and organizing community-wide events. Let us envision a school that works with the community, that is part of the community. Plan for us, build for us what we need for our kids in this community. It is irrational to think that our students can track all the way to other parts of the Bronx when it is so difficult to get out of the neighborhood of Highbridge or into the neighborhood of Highbridge. We're here uh, with my friends Alicia, Alan, Jose, and Jocelyn. And they're here to say, through their artwork, which speaks louder than whatever words any adult can say here today, as to what type of school we want. The art show displayed neighborhood students' drawings of their ideal middle schools. At the show, the United Parents of Highbridge announced the city's approval of the new middle school. And parents decided to push for an environmental curriculum and an ecologically friendly building. After the city approved the site for the school and shared the architect's plans, the United Parents of Highbridge celebrated their victory, a new middle school focused on environmental sciences and sustainable energy. So the group began to make the new middle school an effective platform for high school and college success, the core of CEJ's ongoing campaign. CEJ's ongoing organizing had persuaded the city to expand its middle school initiative by increasing the amount of grant awards to struggling middle schools and by doubling the number of those schools receiving grants. So CEJ members began to develop a kindergarten to 12 reform platform that would prepare all the city students to graduate high school and succeed in college and careers. The thing that was different about CEJ is that because there was so much effort put into making sure that people had time to learn about each other and about the issues that we were working on, there was just a huge amount of, kind of human capital that we didn't have before. There are these amazing meetings that happen once a month on Saturdays where parents do a lot of preparation work. Those meetings have been kind of the, the core of the culture of CEJ. The culture of CEJ features simultaneous translation at all steering committee meetings. That's why these CEJ leaders are wearing headphones. There's no way you can come into somebody's community and not offer translation if you really want those parents engaged in what you're talking about. It's about respecting the cultures and the neighborhoods that we're targeting, the neighborhoods where our children are really failing are black and Latino areas. Okay. Thank you. So they say, as the song says, if you can do it in New York, you can do it anywhere. All right? <laughs> um, so the issues change, um, but the process and the elements are the same, uh, depending on what's happening. So, so what do you think? This is now questions for, for you, OK? What do you think made them successful? What did you see? In the, in the example of Glenmont, uh, as well as this example, what did they do to make them successful? Yes. They united. They united that right to do that. That was it. That just saw yes. Right. They organized and they got solutions. That's part of it. They had the rallies. They had the strategies, but they had also solutions in mind. That's very important. This wasn't like just demanding, yeah. right? Just demanding you do something for us. This was, we've been doing our homework. We know what you should be doing. Listen to us. Yes. Perseverance. Perseverance. They didn't stop, right? You saw those years go by, right? But it was success. What else? Ambitious. Excuse me? Ambitious. Ambitious. They didn't set like, okay, maybe we'll just start with sweeping our streets, right, and stop there. They had high goals because what was at stake? The, the children's education is all about the children and their families, right? They understood what the prize was, okay? So nothing was too great, no time. What else did they do? They had the vision of what they wanted. 
Yes, the vision, the big part of it. They know where they're going. Not only did they have the statistics and they had the research, but they had an idea that was bigger than anybody expected. Who would have expected that? So when I first saw this, I said, said, and what was the answer? You would think that, that the first thing they would want was, let's say, an African-American studies program or Latinx. No, they wanted ecology, environment. They exceeded people's expectations, right? They went beyond the stereotypes and said, we want better than that minimum. Yeah, somebody back here, I'm sorry, and then we'll go. I'm sorry. That's real. This is your point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Yes. It's important they listen to the children. They listen to the children too. The children got involved. Mm -hmm. Great. So that's it. You see all these different pieces. Now I'm going to talk about some of these key elements. Okay. Um, as you said, the leadership, forming the initial group. Okay. That they had leaders from different groups representing different organizations also different cultures, different parts of the city, okay? So who are leaders? Who are leaders? Anybody. Anybody, that's the answer, right? Anybody, you have kids, adults, different things there. Many times in working around the country, it's always the one thing I ever hear is that I never thought I'd be a leader. I never thought I was a leader. If it always, always said, I ask people, how did you become a leader, how did you get involved? I never thought I was gonna be a leader, but then one day, you know, it's always that story. Everybody can do it, do it. And what makes them a leader? The decision. Excuse me? The decision. The decision, yes. They decide to step up, right? But what do leaders need more than anything else? Followers. Followers, right. That's something we lose in this country. We have all these leadership training programs. We're talking, I'm in leadership Montgomery. I don't have any followers except the people who I hire for me, but they made me a leader. That's not a leader. Leaders need followers. And what that's important about that is that because that means you have a responsibility to them. You don't have followers if you don't meet, meet their needs. Leaders, good leaders, like good politicians, okay, meet the needs. Or I should say, politicians as good, uh, are good leaders. They meet the needs of their members. They have a connection, and they don't forget that connection because then you find there are less people following behind you, less members. So that, that what they talked about communications as being important, and you talked about communications, it's not only communications with the bigger public, but the people who are standing with you and behind you and are gonna support you with their ambitions and dreams, okay? The, one of the most important thing and the hardest thing, to, one of the hardest and most exciting things to learn as an organizer is about the issue. An organizer called cutting the issue, but it's the idea of finding issues. And one of the most amazing stories that I've always find in American history is the story of Rosa Parks. If everybody knows that about that, was the woman who decided to sit behind the back of the bus, sit in the front of the bus in the South. Well, one of the things I've been very fortunate is I, I, I lived in, in, in the South for a while and um, got to see some of the tapes of the planning meetings of the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Council, the people behind it. Now, the movies make it sound like it was just one woman one day tired, you know, and she says, oh, I'm going to sit in the front of the bus. That's not the truth. That's good for movies, right? <laughs> Cecily Tyson did a great job. But what it really was about was they had a plan. Okay, they met for weeks and weekends from around the South to say we needed a place and what was going to be the issue. Now they knew what the problem was. The problem was segregation. But if you said we're going to fight segregation, that's depressing, right? That's a problem. We're going to fight crime, okay. We're going to fight, you know, racism. It's hard to do that. But they knew that the issue, what was the issue that they wanted to look at that would get people angry and excited? the seat, that we could not sit on the seat of the bus, as sometimes to some people sounded so silly, that was the thing that became the symbol that everybody, right, knows about. That's the difference between a problem, which can be overwhelming and depressing, and something as straightforward as a seat on a bus can become the issue that you will die for, okay? So what are some of those issues, for example, as you think about it, in your neighborhood in Montgomery County. That's what we meant by MC. <laughs> what are some of those things that come to mind? Excuse me? What about education? That's the problem. Bad education. What's the issue? Think about it. Yeah, not, not so much about bad education, but access to... Access. That's what we do. To, yeah, right. Right. Some people have access. Some people don't. Like some people got to sit in the front and some people got to sit in the back. 
Equal, that's it. That becomes more. Equal education becomes exciting. Not having access is one thing, but having equal education is very good. So that's very, thank you for the clarification, and that's the point, right? Equal education, equal resources, yes. Excuse me? Communications, what about communications? What aren't you getting? Or what are you getting? What about communications that makes it a problem in the an issue in the county? The language, the language. Some people can hear and some people can't. <laughs> some people can understand, some people can. The timing, when meetings are held, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding how hard families work when you're working two jobs, right? And the teachers don't want to come work past three or four o'clock. Or maybe it's not even the teachers. I will say that because my wife is a teacher, okay? Maybe it's the policies don't let you stay later, okay? Evolve media, also that's part and important strategy, very important. How the media may make people look. Yeah. We worked in it with my colleague Ken Lee, who's here, we worked in, in Miami where the issue was always that we found Latino and African Americans, the media made, they only showed crime, right? Uh, and that, but that's the issue, how you portray us, the difference. So that's very important, yes, what's another one? Yeah, that's the problem, and that's what the part of the process does. That's the next element is then to begin to think about, so that's the issue, and then the next thing is the knowledge of what works and what doesn't, okay, and how systems work. Because you can't change systems if you don't know how to operate it, right? You can't fix a car if you don't know how a car works, right? Okay, so you have to, if you're going to fix the school system, if you can do that, you have to learn in, about how the school system works, okay? You have to learn what's done before, okay? You have to have a plan. Okay, you saw all those, all those pieces of paper on the wall, right? They were planning, they were learning, they had specific goals in mind, okay? And then what actions, what strategies they were taking, what actions, and the going back themselves and say, is this working? Okay, so that planning is important. It's a lot of work, but it's a good way because not only can you figure out, are we doing what we're supposed to do, and we can go back to our members and say, hey, our plan is working or it's not, and this is how we're gonna fix it. And the plan needs to be winnable. We have to start small with what we can do and get those victories so we can begin momentum. Um, the other part I want to mention is communications, right? Everyone needs to be involved. You heard communications here. Keeping in touch with your members, as somebody said earlier. Absolutely. Building relationships with other people in your community and with other communities, as I mentioned earlier. And then celebration, you know? I say we, we need to celebrate. We'll make that point again. Those victories have come long, they come hard, and sometimes we want to move on, but it's so important to celebrate victories. As an organizer for years, the best part is to realize we are getting somewhere, we are winning, we are succeeding, okay? The last thing I want to say about it that's left out here, but it's very important, is support. One of the things, reasons why I also like this is support from outside. Like the people in New York who did it there, you have the support of a council, uh, a vice president, vice chair of the council, of the county council. You have another council member here. You have institutions. This is co-sponsored by big institutions. So you have that support. You, you always will want more. Um, and it's important to be, stay in contact with that, to have the support. They had the Annen, uh, Annenberg uh, group. Actually, it was out of the, it's a whole long story with Brown University. But they had them doing work for them, doing their research. Parents, you all need to lead, and then you have to have your research department and the people doing the work for you, just like the president of IBM. Your leaders, the president of IBM doesn't go out and do, do his research. You have schools, Montgomery College, you have this university, you have many universities just in your neighborhood alone who can help with that and organizations like ours and Greg's and stuff like that, uh, groups like that that can begin to help you and support you and use that support because that's what we're really here supposed to do. I'll now turn this over to Greg who'll talk about the uh, process again and sum up the process we've seen here. Okay, thank you. I, I hope you enjoyed that video. I certainly found it inspirational myself. Um, I, again, I, I'm not going to take up too much more time, but I think we're, we're all sort of clear on what, the, what some of the basic outline of this process is, which it starts with a few individuals that have enough interest to bring in other individuals. Um, some of the things that I gleaned from the video that are, uh, were also sort of present in the Glenmont experience and other experiences that I've been part of, again, is working with the stakeholders, working with the partners. You can't do it alone, per se. But you also have to take ownership, whether it's your community, it's your issue, it's yours. That's the only thing, any, any way, anything will ever change. 
um, and be concise and consistent. You know, you saw that they had an initial success, but they came back, I think, in the video they showed that they had a, an organizing rally that happened the second time around. And eventually they got, you know, the resources that, that they needed for their kids. It was the new school, the grants, and they got a seat at the table, which means they got to speak with um, the policymakers and the politicians and got their attention. And that's one thing I found, again, in my experience in, you know, working in other cities on, on neighborhood issues. You know, one person can have a lot of gripes or a lot of issues, but it's not until you have a, a group that, you know, it's the whole squeaky wheel gets the, the grease concept. And, and, and it really translates to credibility as well. Once you have an organized group that shows that it's uh, together and working towards the same front, um, then that's something that, uh, that that's, you know, will lead to success eventually. So, uh, again... You could take uh, additional workshops or classes on the details of how to go about the planning and the strategic planning, the action steps. But for today, we'll leave it at this, and I, and I believe there are some, some next steps. And David, I don't know if you had anything else to add. Otherwise, we'll probably turn it over to the councilwoman again. So, thank you.